on today's episode of Gathering the Kings. Give us an example of a good decision that you've made, something that you've determined that you've wanted. You made the decision, it worked, something that maybe we can learn from. Yeah, so I credit this one to my wife more than myself, and she is a part of our practice. She's our director of marketing. And this is a decision that I talk about quite often because I was dead set against it. What's up, everybody? I'm Chaz Wolf, Gathering the Kings podcast. Today, I've got Larry Sprung here on the King stage. My brother, Larry, how we doing? I am awesome, Chaz. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. You know, I always have a little bit of a connection time with each one of my guests for sometimes a long time, actually, before we hit the record button. But within a few minutes, you and I have already just had a very interesting back and forth. I am so excited for this conversation. We know some of the same people. We're in some of the same lanes with podcasts and business. And, and I'm excited for this conversation. So thank you for being here. Tell us what kind of business or interest that you have, my friend. Yeah. So my, my company is Midland Financial. We're a wealth management firm. So we help families design and develop financial plans and then help them implement it to work towards whatever goals they're looking to achieve and, and hopefully find their freedom. Yeah. I love that. Love that. You've said that once or twice before. It's sharp. You've also got a podcast, right? You, uh, you, you, for those that are watching on YouTube, you can see his, his backdrop there looks sharp. But, but you were just telling me you're not a spring chicken when it comes to podcasting. Give us two seconds on your podcast. Yeah, I mean, I, I still feel like a spring chicken because I'm 140 episodes in and I'm learning every day. And we have some awesome guests. Evidently, we've had some of the same guests. So that's, that's right. uh, an interesting you know, overlap there. But our, our guests really range from entrepreneurs that really just have interesting, cool businesses to sports and professional athletes as well as mental health related shows. I, you know, we talk a lot about being financially fit, physically fit and mentally fit at our, at our company. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. So it's a fairly inclusive perspective or a wholesome perspective. We kind of give the same thought around uh, towards business owners, not only helping them with their business, but the business is like has tentacles in all these other areas, of course, fitness and athleticism and the way that we think our mindset our families, our marriages. You know, we were just talking about your son doing all kinds of really cool things as well. But <clears throat> all that stuff bleeds together for entrepreneurs. And I definitely want to get to that on how that's impacted you in your journey, because that's a big part of a uh, big part of the show here as well. But I got to know before we get kind of too much in the story, Larry, what is like the, the heartbeat, the, the drum that beats inside of you louder than anything else? You know, the thing that burns late at night. What is that for you? Family, 100%. I mean, my family is most important. And when I, when I talk about family, it's not just my immediate family, meaning my wife and my two kids and my extended family by blood. It also means my work family, right? I have a great team here that we spend a lot of time together. In some cases, I spend more time with the team here than I do with that blood-related family. So by all means, a, a lot of the things in the decision-making processes, whether it's personal or on the business side, really revolves around that family first mentality. Yeah, I love that. I want to go just one layer deeper than that because the listener might be thinking like, okay, like, yeah, that's a great answer, but like, where's the meat, right? And so Larry, for you, I know a little bit of, you know, some of the pieces of your story that you've already shared with me before we hit the record button, but why is family like that for you? Why did family become the top priority? Why did it roll off your tongue so fast? when yeah. you said it, because everybody has family, but not everybody thinks like you do. So why is it that you think this way? Yeah, I mean, it was ingrained in me. I, I came from a family first environment as a kid. And then more importantly, which I, I write about the story in my book, Financial Planning Made Personal, about my mom. My mom was diagnosed when I was about 13 years old with cancer. She passed away the day after my 23rd birthday at the wow. age of 47. So yeah. that was... That was one impression right there. Second impression was my wife's brother, after a long battle with mental health, died by suicide in 2004 at the age of 27. Wow. So, you know, having life events like that taking place, it really leaves an indelible mark and really makes you understand how short life can be and yeah. how important family is. So ever since I was young, most importantly, because of my mom at that early age, 
family was just something that always came first. And if it meant going to a client meeting or a family meeting or going to watch my kids or bring them to hockey practice, hockey practice would always trump that. And the families we serve and we work with here know that. And I think that's yeah. one of the reasons why they're driven here. Yeah. Okay. So we're kind of getting into a little bit of the tastiness. Let's keep going because you had some crazy circumstances that shifted your perspective. And then you're trying your best now to live with the recognition that life is short, like you said, or it can be shorter than maybe we expect. And then trying to you know give that same perspective to other people. But for the guy listening right now or the gal listening right now, who's never had that life altering experience of a loved one passing or some just crazy circumstances that shifts the perspective like you have, what would you say to them to help them understand what you just said, which is really dialing into the relationships, really dialing into the time that you have with them. And some of the other things that maybe we put value to aren't really that valuable. In essence, what is what the story really is? Why, what would you tell that person? I, I, I think you have to have a fundamental understanding about and a feeling about wanting to do it first, right? But it's something that can be done. I know a lot of people go through life and they go through their you know, regular daily routines and they think they don't have time to do this or they don't have time to do that. Yeah. And you really just have to prioritize. It really comes down to what your core values are. And if you really, truly believe that you want to put family first and make that a core value, then you have to start designing your life and, and your goals and your around that. And I think that's something everybody can do. I think yeah. it's something that a lot of people think they can't. But it can be done. It just, it, you have to have a fundamental shift in focus. And you don't need somebody passing away at an early age to do that. It could be even the birth of a child, you know, reframing the way you look at something or getting married or yeah. maybe just realizing, hey, you know, this isn't the way I want my life designed. I don't want to go to work just 40 hours a week and not have time to do these other things. Right. All you have to do is commit to it and, and build a life around that and make sure that your decision-making process is being filtered through that at all times. Yeah. You're given such succinct answers, you know, like this is exactly how we go and this is why we do it. And, and it's very well thought out. You've clearly spent a lot of time not only processing your own perspective change, but then also developing a thing that you can follow probably also for your children. And then now maybe through your book and podcast and and helping your clients, you're able to kind of extend that impact. But what's the first step that somebody takes? Or what did you do maybe after, you know, mom or brother scenario where you started implementing some of these like, because it wasn't so succinct back then, I'm going to guess, right? I disagree. It really was. Okay. It's something that from a very early age that I started implementing, you know, even when I first got married, for example, right? My office at the time, I was working for a company. It was prior to me launching my firm. And, you know, where we were living on a good day, if I left early in the morning, it was like a 25-minute ride. On a bad day, it could be an hour and 20-minute ride here on Long Island. Traffic can be brutal. So as we, my wife and I started approaching the idea of having children, I said, hey, you know, I can't do this ride if I'm going to want to be there then I'm going to have to make a decision that I'm either going to miss some of those life events or I have to move closer to home where there's not going to be as great a travel, you know, travel between the office and home or their school or what have you. And yeah. I literally circled a 10 mile radius around my house. And I said, I'm going to find an office within those 10 miles because that's where I want to be and put that family first. And that's what I did. It took me about two years, finally found a location that is literally seven miles from my house. It's 12 minutes on a bad day. And, you know, it, it's that easy. I think that you just have to start planning things around that and looking at your life, whatever it is, if you want to put family first or whatever right. that main objective is, start filtering all those decisions that you have to make and say, hey, is right. this moving me closer to or further away from that whatever value yeah. that I want to have? And then, you know, you know, make the decision accordingly. Yeah. Yeah. Now we're getting into some, some stuff that I love to talk about, which is what you, every, your sentence that you just used, I've used on so many different platforms around, well, the decision's easy when you realize what you want. If you don't know what you want, then, then we're confused. Right. And so what you're saying is that you knew family was important to you from the beginning. Boom. Here's what it was. It's not that you 
haven't grown in that area, I'm sure you've grown tremendously, but you at least had made a decision that this is important to me. So then therefore the decisions that I make are based off of that. This is going to transition us right into some good and bad decisions here. But before I, I want to hear your story, how did you even get into like re representing other people and their finances and helping them? And like, you know, New York's a big place. Well, well, tell us about your story. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of this again is, in, you know, and, and going back to that last question, just to hit on that, you know, a lot of this is in my book, Financial Planning Made Personal. And one of the chapters is find your why. And to your point, it's not just for me to find my why as a person. It's for a company, you know, it can right. be really relate. You have to find your why so you know what you're doing and why you're doing it and yeah. also figure out what you should be doing and what you shouldn't be doing, right? Yeah. So how, how I ended up here, I basically came from a, you know, a solid middle-class family. We weren't rich, we weren't poor, had a dad that was a New York City school teacher and also had a, a couple of side hustles before they were even called side hustles. They used to be uh -huh. called second jobs back then. Yep, that's and, right. <laughs> yeah, and seeing him go through the situation with my mom really, you know, as we've discussed, really left a yeah. mark on me. And yeah. not not that having a financial advisor or somebody like myself in his life would have mitigated any of my mom's health situation, the bills right. or anything like that, but I really feel like if he had somebody like me, that it would have helped alleviate some of the weight off of his shoulders. And, yeah. and he didn't. And that really resonated with me as I started going on, you know, finishing high school, going into college and, you know, learning more about this profession. And it I was really drawn to it because I felt like it was such a great profession that you got to work with people, help them work towards their goals, you know, hopefully not only work with them, but then work with their kids and grandkids. And it was something right. I could do you know, for a very long time. So that's really what drove me to the profession. And that's what keeps me here every day. It keeps me fired up knowing that we are having a, such a solid impact on the families we serve every day. And we're yeah. here as a resource for them. And hopefully it's not just in times like my dad went through in terms of right. trying to help them through bad times, but we also want to help families in good times, working towards buying a house, getting married, you know, maybe buying a second home, retirement, whatever, right. finding their freedom, whatever financial freedom means to them, we sure. want to help them work towards that end goal for them and their family. Yeah. And you, you gave a really good picture earlier of what discernment looks like, which is determine what you want and then make decisions today that helps you get there. Even if the impact of those decisions isn't today, the, the, the impact of the decision that you're making today if you're working with Larry around some sort of financial goal or retirement or getting married, all these things that he just mentioned, isn't necessarily something that you're gonna see the result of today. It might be next week, it might be next year, it might be 10 years from now, right? Or it might be it's 40 funny. years from now. <laughs> yeah. Right. But right. I think that at what the natural way that you think, this, this very discerning way, is something that entrepreneurs sometimes can get excited about, right? We can get excited about the future, but then in the day to day to make the decision that aligns with what we say or think that we want, it's hard, right? There's a big disconnect oftentimes, especially when someone can get excited about the future, but then the, the implementation of the decision making or the, the day to day, the saving, the, this type of decision, whatever financial plan that you guys have come up with, it's the same thing in their business and it's the same thing with the family. If you had just kept driving to the same office, but saying that you wanted to spend more time with your family, there's a disconnect. Would you agree? Right. Yeah, hundred percent. And I think I think that's where a lot of people get hung up, right? Because they have this idea of what they want and and maybe what they want their life to look like, but ultimately they don't necessarily carve out the time to sit down and figure out how to get there. And yeah. you know, in some cases you can do it on your own. Some cases you can't. You need somebody to assist you in. You know, maybe you could articulate what that vision is. Just like an entrepreneur, they may have the vision, but you right. may need that implementer person to help you implement that vision uh, and take the reins over, you know, that decision making process. So you have yeah. to, you know, if you can do both and, and take care of both those things yourself, then that's great. Or you may need some help along the way to do it. But unless you carve out the time, I think the point here is unless you carve out the time to think about these things and actually put a little bit of work in 
You know, it's not like you just wake up one day and say, hey, I want to be family first and that's what I'm going to do today and then just expect everything to happen. There are going right. to be things, events, decisions that you're going to need to make and some work you're going to need to put in to help get you there. And yeah. that's the important thing to remember. Yeah. The it, it's almost what you I mean, well, it's not almost it is. It is what you do. You help people slow down just enough to be able to help think about the future. So that they can put a plan together now so that they can take the action steps on a daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, yearly basis so that they can get what they want in the future. What else would you leave this person listening with right now around this kind of good decision making? And I want to ask you a good decision that you've made, but just this construct that we've built around determining what you want and then figuring out a plan, slowing down to make the plan. What else would you leave them with as far as like just wisdom? I mean, this is what you do on a daily basis every day with your clients. What else would you give us? Yeah, I mean, listen, if, you, if you're in the boat that you don't have this information, right, you, you haven't even thought about this, but you have an idea of what you want to do, what I would suggest is after you're done listening to this show, carve out 15 minutes and jot down three things, three things that you're going to do starting today that's going to help you start working towards whatever that why is for you. You yeah. know, because most people, I think, inherently they have an idea of what they want and what their why is. They may not have written it down. They may not have verbalized it, but they sure. have an idea. So when, when you're done listening to this show, sit down, three things that you're going to immediately implement and put into practice and make sure you follow through on them in the next seven to 10 days. Because listen, without action, there's nothing. And you have to have, once you put it in writing, you've now committed to it and now you got to do yeah. it. Yep. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to go one step further, Larry. I'm going to tell him to pause right now. Don't go another step further. <laughs> get out a piece of paper, get out a pen, write down those things right now. Otherwise, you won't do it. I know you. I'm an entrepreneur like you. Don't wait. OK, Larry, give us an example of a de good decision that you've made, something that you've determined that you've wanted. You made the decision. It worked. Something that maybe we can learn from. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I credit this one to my wife more than myself. And, you know, she is in, in part of our practice. She's our director of marketing. And this is a decision that I talk about quite often because I was dead set against it. And that is, you know, from a marketing perspective and looking to grow our firm and the number of stakeholders we have and the number of families we serve, you know, about four or five years ago, she approached me, she said, Hey, you got to be more active on social media. People need to know who you are. They need to learn who Larry Sprung really is. They need to see more of you. And I was like, people don't want to see me going here or going there or on a trip or away with the family. And she said, they do. And I said, all right, listen, we'll give it a try. And we started implementing it. And long story short, the thing that really you know, sealed the deal, so to speak, for me was my family and I went on a trip to South Africa in 2019. Okay. And my, my youngest son was 13. He got bar mitzvahed. And in lieu of a big party like they do here in New York, he chose to go on a family vacation on the safari. And wow. we basically, you know, documented the whole trip, posting everywhere we were going on a daily basis. And when I got back from that trip, because we had a lot of engagement on our posts on social media, et cetera, a couple of things happened. One was we had a family that we work with where she was, uh, her health wasn't great. So she wasn't able to travel, but South Africa and safari was something that she always wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And she called me up when we got back and she said, wow, she goes, I have to thank you. I'm like, thank me for what? She goes, because you documented your trip in the way you did, I feel like I was on safari with you and your family. Yeah. And I was like, wow, what an impact that was, right? Yeah. And I was yeah. like, you know, right then and there, that was one. And then the second thing was we started seeing an uptick, a huge uptick in inquiries with our firm. You know, hey, Larry, I, you know, I'm interested. This is going on in my life. Can you help us out? Right. And, and, the lesson I took away from it was, yeah, she was right. My wife was right. And it was a good decision that we that I followed her recommendation, probably one of the best from a business perspective that I've made in a long time. And, you know, sometimes it's tough when you have a certain kind of predisposition to something That's and right. change and changing your mind and, and doing it. And it's been hugely beneficial to us and for us as a result. And, uh, you know, it's one of the best decisions I've made for sure. 
Yeah. And a hundred and what'd you say? 40 episodes later, you have a podcast and I'm sure that gets cut up and put up all over social media so we can get to know you even better. I mean, listen, in this day and age, I think, you know, I have talked about this as well, you know, going, going out there, it used to be, we used to have to have four or five, six meetings with a family before they decided to start working with us. Now it's usually one meeting. And the reason that is, we feel, is by the time they get into our office or they schedule that introductory appointment, yep. they already know us, they like us, and they trust us because they, they've seen everything we do as people and as, as a business. So yeah. it cuts down a lot of that, uh, that time for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the same five meetings are happening. They're just not happening with right. you. They're happening with the yeah. virtual you that's already been recorded, yeah. which is actually a, a leverage point that you have now because um, mm-hmm. it's less manual work, the recording that you had already done and paid for one time is doing the work for you ahead of time. I had a, a recent inquiry, maybe it was Facebook or Instagram, I can't remember. Hey, I see what you're doing. I like your stuff. It was such an interesting conversation because you could tell he had just found me. And so it was like, I found you. I looked at it. It's super interesting. I don't know anything about you yet, but I wanted to like reach out and say, hey, I appreciate it. But like, don't try to sell me, but like, I want more information. Can you send me to your podcast? Can you send me any videos about you? I saw all your other interviews. Like, it was just a very interesting play. And and my point in saying all this is that oftentimes now in business, that's actually the consumer's desire also is to do those five meetings without you. They're with you, but they're not with you. And they feel in control and they feel safe and they don't feel like they're being sold anything. And when they're ready, they make a move. They have the initial meeting and you thought, well, geez, man, I've only taken one meeting these days. It's like, well, no, it, it, yes, you're right, but no, the work's been done ahead of time. And actually it fits their buying cycle or their buying desires as well. Have you seen that on your side as well? Oh, 100%. And I think that the other thing that has come out of it is from a standpoint of, you know, the podcast and blogs and videos is it gives you another tool where if somebody has a question about something, right? that you may have had a guest on that's an expert, or you may have a blog article that speaks to that point, rather than you even getting on the phone or typing out this huge email, explaining to them how you might be able to assist or what they should be thinking about or doing, it gives you a really easy way. Here's a link to a, an expert that I had with the, you know, that talks about the problem you're having. I right. think you'd find it helpful. And again, to your point, it's not a salesy thing. It's just really a helpful thing. And then if they're interested and need further assistance, they come back and find us. But yeah, I think a lot of those meetings are are definitely happening, you know, over somebody's PC prior to them reaching us. And and that's hugely beneficial to to us and I'm sure you as well. Yeah. 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 It's beneficial on both sides of the story for the consumer as well. But I want to talk, I want to flip the script here. I want to talk about a bad decision. And and so same construct, I guess, right, of how to make good decisions, but maybe it just, it just didn't work out. It wasn't your best hour. Tell us the juicy details. What can we learn from it? Hey, Chaz Wolf here. As many of you know, I have been on an absolute mission to help entrepreneurs from all across the country in many different industries level up their game and grow their business and intentionally connect with other entrepreneurs. We do that obviously through the podcast, but we also have a peer-to-peer mastermind group specifically for seven to nine figure business owners. We are bringing some of the best and most successful entrepreneurs and minds together in a regular and a super intentional way to not only grow our network, but to be able to leverage. And at a certain point in business, success becomes about leverage, leveraging time, leveraging resources, leveraging key relationships. This is exactly what we're doing inside of the peer-to-peer mastermind group called Gathering the Kings, specifically for seven to nine figure business owners. So if that's you, if you're ready to level up your seven to nine figure business even to the next level and get around other big hitters just like you, I want you to go to gatheringthekings.com, fill out a short application, and uh, it'll come to an application uh, call with me, and I want to chat with you to see if it might be a good fit. Talk soon. I, you know, I, I, that one takes a lot of work for me to think about as far as bad decisions, because I don't make many, but with that being said, I, I think probably if I had to align myself with one, it would be, you know, looking back at myself becoming independent. So a little bit of kind of history, when I first entered the profession way back when, I worked for some of the bigger investment houses, if you will. 
Sure. And I did that for about, you know, six, seven years until I launched my own firm in, you know, Midland Financial in 2004. And to some degree, I, I think it was a bad decision because I got wrapped up in the fact that, oh, you know, I'm a young guy, I'm new to the profession, I have to work for this big organization so people will want to work with me. Mm-hmm. And, you know, to some degree, I, I don't regret the time that I spent there because I did a lot of learning and I learned a lot there. But, sure. but at the same time, probably the one regret or bad decision I have is I probably could have made the move a little bit earlier because mm-hmm. I feel like, you know, being independent and being a fiduciary is hugely beneficial to allowing us to help the families we serve. Uh, yeah. Just to give you an example, when I was working for one of these firms, I had a manager that came to me and said, hey, you know, Larry, you know, how can we raise the revenue for our team? And this was, you know, back in the, you know, early 2000s when we weren't so team oriented as we are now. Sure. And not for nothing, at that point, the team did not have any impact on my income, only I did. Right. So, so I looked at her and I said, you know, the interesting thing to that question is I don't see how, you know, the team would impact my revenue and my income. So if you're asking me what I could do, I said, well, we're having about 40 hours a month in conference calls and, you know, meetings. I said, eliminate those. I'll get an extra week to talk to folks. And I could assure you my opportunities will increase significantly as a result. And yeah. she didn't like, she didn't like that answer. And my, you know, my, my sense was a lot of the questions were always around how much revenue did you drive? And my sense was always, how many families did we help this week, this month, right. this year? Yeah. And my sense was always that the revenue and everything else would fall into line. So, you know, thinking about bad decisions, you know, it might have been a bad decision to stay there as long as I did in, in some of those organizations. Yeah. Uh, because being independent has been, you know, tremendously freeing and beneficial, not only to us, but definitely to the families we serve as well. Yeah. There's a bunch that you know now that you, that you didn't know then, obviously it's right. hindsight, right? Always. What do you think that you, what do you, what's that, what's that first thing that just popped into your head when I said that, that you know now, they were like, oh my gosh, if I had known that at that age, I would have left five years sooner. What's like that, that most important thing that you can now do for your clients or that you, that's beneficial to you guys or whatever that scenario is? Like, what's the hindsight now? Yeah. I mean, back then I didn't even know what an RIA registered investment advisor and what a fiduciary was. Back then I thought everybody was a broker, you know, so people, I thought everybody in our profession basically charged a commission and got paid to do trades. And that was not the case. I mean, RIAs like we are, you know, have been around since the mid eighties, I believe. So when I started in the profession, they were a thing. They just weren't talked about. So I didn't know about them. You know, all I knew about was, you know, if you think about the firm, the, the movie Wolf of Wall Street, right. uh, I literally, the first firm I ever worked at was a firm that was like that, but that was all I knew. I only knew about you know, getting on the phone and cold calling and trying to touch base with families who didn't know us. And I didn't know about, you know, networking and marketing within your circles, et cetera. So I learned all that while at one of those organizations. So that's the benefit. But I didn't even know being a fiduciary was something that existed that being independent would bring me to. Yeah. You also mentioned one other thing I want to pick your further thoughts on. And I've had a lot of people on the show kind of be in this lane, but you said it like families helped as opposed to revenue generated. And so for the person listening right now who maybe doesn't understand what that means or they don't understand how to connect the feeling of, well, how, okay, so I helped ha- families this month with the decks that I built or the marketing campaigns that I built. Like, how do they translate helping people or families in your case to the daily tasks? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we talk about joy here a lot. You know, one, one of the, our final question on our podcast that we ask everybody is, what did you do today that brought you joy? And in, in our book, when we talk, the book's title is Financial Planning Made Personal. And the subtitle is, what did you do today that brought you joy? So the kind of the way we look at things, right? Because a lot of advisors, a lot of people in our profession, always talking about the money. You need this amount of money for retirement, this amount of money to send your child to school, whatever right. that goal is or objective. What we talk about is, well, what's the joy that's going to be derived from 
accumulating those assets. You know, what's the joy? The joy may be watching your son or daughter or child, you know, walking through and getting their diploma or walking and getting married and knowing that you've accumulated the money to pay for the wedding, the joy. Right. So you have to think about what the joy the family is going to be getting out of. So when, when our stakeholders here are opening accounts, we don't look at it as opening an account. We look at it as a pathway to that joy, whatever that savings is for and the joy they're going to receive. So whatever business you're in, you could really take that same framework and say, hey, you know, whatever I do, what kind of joy is the family that I'm working for or with or the business owner that, you know, if you're B2B, what the, what's the joy the business owner is going to get out of me working with them? Yeah. And think about that. It's not opening an account. It's not having a Zoom. It's, it's working towards that, uh, down that joy road to get them there. Yeah, that's such a great answer. I hope that the listener is paying attention. <clears throat> joy can be easily prompt on, removed, taken away by busyness and all the things that we think that we want, but really the things that we want, we're just not making good decisions on. So therefore there is no joy. It's also interesting because one of our core values as Gathering the Kings is that kings are levity. And the very definition of levity is the removal of stress or pressure and the insertion of joy. And so I just think that I think that that's a king move on your part, but you're not only doing it for yourself, but but you're doing it, you know, for all your stakeholders, the people that are in your company, as well as all your clients. So I just really appreciate that perspective. I think that the listener can take that away pretty practically. So thanks for giving that to us. I want to know inside the business, what's like the most important KPI for you? If you can only pick one to track forever and ever, what would you pick? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's, it's a hard KPI to really track, but we look at the number of families served. That's the number one. I wish there was a way for us to successfully and easily track the number of goals that we help families successfully achieve, but that's cool. Sometimes, yeah. Yeah. That's tough. But so we look at the families that we're serving and how yeah. many we're serving, how many new families we're working with on an annual basis, because we have a pretty, you know, succinct process about and who and what families we bring on board. We want to make sure that there are families that have issues, concerns, and challenges that we can help them solve. And we want to have a family that's not going to be with us for three, six months, a year. We want families that are going to be with us for multi-generations. So we have some families that we're serving today that were on second, third, and in some cases, almost fourth generations moving in that direction. So those are the types of relationships we have. So the number one KPI for us is family served for sure. Yeah, I love that. You kind of just hinted at one of my family goals. And it's a, it's a generational target, but some people are motivated by legacy in that way of, of kind of paving the path for multiple generations. But being a, a financial planner and clearly a good decision maker, what does one have to do to genuinely take care of, call it three generations? From a, from a standpoint of uh, you as you a, fill in an the investor, blank. Yeah. as an investor, yeah, investor or money-wise. Oh yeah, no, no, as the, as the person. So like if you're advising okay. me to take care of my three, next three generations, Right. What, what are, give us, you know, maybe one or two things that I could, I could start doing today. Yeah. I mean, you have to make smart decisions. I think that's, that's the, you know, most important part. And if you make a bad decision or the wrong decision, you have to be very quick to fix that, get out of it, move on, take the loss, whatever it is and, and move forward. That's, that's important. Two is you have to start early, right? If you're first generation wanting to start generational wealth, you have to start very early and start putting money away and using what we even call in the book, the eighth wonder of the world, which is compound, compound interest. interest, you know, and I think you have to remove the emotion from your decision-making process because that's really what, you know, hangs up a lot of people we find from and hinders them from creating that generational wealth. You know, if they're lucky enough that they make smart decisions and then they start early mm -hmm. and, and then something goes awry in the world and they get nervous and pull money out or, you know, then it, that causes the emotion causes them to make a bad decision that can have a significant impact for them accumulating that multi-generational wealth. So what you want to do is do all, you know, make the right decisions, start early, remove the emotion away from it as much as possible and let the money work for you. And if you follow those three things, typically that'll help you at least start on a path of creating that multi-generational wealth. Yeah, I love that. I get super fired up about 
my kids, my grandkids, doing deals with my grandkids. Maybe one day my great grand grandkids. I don't know, but I, I got a question for you. This is a little interesting piece here, but you know, it's obviously subjective. But to you, what's the number of indestructible wealth? Like, how much dollar? Let's just put it in dollars. <clears throat> how much do I need to come up with, or how much do I need to eventually in my family? Maybe maybe that's after I'm gone. Maybe that's something that my children pick up after me. But what's the number eventually that we get to as a wolf family where it's indestructible? Or does yeah, that even I, exist? I don't know that it does exist. And, you know, one of the things that we, you know, again, with the book, Financial Planning Made Personal, I really believe that financial planning is very personal. There are a lot of rules, general rules of thumb, if you will, that people say you should follow. The reality is financial planning is so personal because, you know, for you, maybe you, you know, your ex expectation is I need $50,000 a year. Sure you know, inflated every year by inflation for, you know, to sustain those multi-generations. Then there might be another family that might need $250,000 a year under those same constraints. Those savings goals and those needs to create that multi-generational wealth is going to be quite different amounts. The other thing is, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing that's indestructible. And, and what do I mean by that? You know, there are many times we see money that's passed on to the second third generation, if they're lucky, maybe the fourth, and then things go awry, it blows up because it's not just about the money. You also have to instill the values into that second, third, and fourth generation because if they have the money, but they don't have the values and the understanding of what that money means, what it's about, and what it took to get that money, and they don't have that pride in it, they're going to squander it. And, you know, any amount of money could be squandered. How many shows, how many shows do you see, you know, the lottery people, people who win the lottery and then they go bust or athletes who get what seems to be indestructible amounts of money in their contracts and it blows up. So I, I don't think there's really anything that is indestructible. The way to insulate that as best as possible is to create as much wealth as you can and create those values so that the generations to come understand what it took to create it, and they're going to have the respect for the money in order to have it continue to last on for multiple generations. Yeah, yeah. It sounds like it can't just be, in this case, in our case, first generation's target. It's got to be a multi-generational target that maybe the initial person like you or me, we have to galvanize the next generation or maybe even the second generation or the third generation around this target because that's where the value is going to come from. That's where the, let me put aside immediate desire and let me delay gratification. Even though we have millions or hundreds of millions, the family target is this or whatever. We can fill in the blank with whatever numbers. And the, and the more galvanized they are, more educated they are, right? The less of that pool of money that you need because they'll respect it more and be able to handle it a bit better. That's true. So true. We, we could have a whole podcast just on Probably. this topic. <laughs> okay. I want to know of a business resource. You've already mentioned your book. I will put it in that in the show notes. I want people to grab that. Sounds like a phenomenal book. What other resources, podcasts, books that you've read, anything that you would suggest that we get a hold of? Yeah. I mean, listen, one of the, the best books that really set me on a path and I, I talk about it all the time. You know, you want to talk about multi-generational wealth is the richest man in Babylon. Such a good uh, book. It re really hits home the whole idea of paying yourself first, which is also a chapter in the book I talk about because we have a tendency to go through life, pay everybody else, and then we get to live on what's left over. And I think that's backwards. Richest Man in Babylon is an unbelievable book. I think for entrepreneurs, Dan Sullivan, Who Not How, I think is hugely impactful. You know, instead of thinking about how to do th how to do certain things, figure out who can do them and right. free up your time to get that done. And then lastly, one other gem is Traction, the EOS operating system, I think is a is a phenomenal read and something that if you implement into your practice can be hugely beneficial i know you know firsthand because it has been here and we operate on that system yeah that's great those are great resources larry appreciate that maybe the first time maybe second time that richest man in babylon's been been introduced here on the show i appreciate that perspective because you're right and it's such a small simple book it could be it could be read in a few hours so i think that uh, that's a great recommendation I got a question for you about family as we kind of close up here. You've been clearly focused on your family. You've already mentioned that, but I want to know as an entrepreneur, so maybe outside of the financial planner, because 
on that world, you're pretty like calculated and always making good decisions. And I understand that there's a personality that fits that pretty well. But over here as an entrepreneur, where we're obsessed is the word, right? Like where we have to be all in all the time and there's no real like light switch. And so for my question for you is how have you been obsessed with your wife and your children, or your family, or the other things that you enjoy in life at the same time as the business? I just don't, I don't feel like balance is the target. I feel like obsession in all areas is the target. And so how have you been able to kind of go all in in those areas at the same time? Yeah, so I don't talk about balance. I talk about work-life harmony because I, I feel like balance gives the implication that something has, you have to give up something to get something. And I, I think that That's there's right. a way that everything can work together. You know, for example, when, when my kids were young and they had, a, you know, hockey tournaments, my wife would go with one of them, my boys, and I would go with the other. And they knew that I was going to have to be doing some work probably over the weekend from Thursday through Sunday. So, you know, I think that that was something that, uh, you know, always made sense to them. And I was all in there. And I, I will say, listen, from for, for to some degree, the business was not as growth oriented as it is today because my boys now are both out of the house. So I have a lot more free time because I'm not driving them to practice anymore or anything like that. So, I mean, you know, it's, it's a tough balance, but it, or I should say, you know, harmony, it's a tough yeah. situation to harmonize, but it, it can be done. And I, I think that it's, it's definitely a challenge, but it, it can be done. And the other thing is the families that we work with very early on, I started, I guess, working with them and getting them to understand how important family was to me. When my first son was born, fr I took Fridays off in I think July. Then the second year I did July and August. And the third year I did June, July and August. And then I had two boys at that point. And to this day, we still get calls from families on Friday who call the office to, and my assistant will ask, Rose will ask, oh, you know, you know, Larry's in today. Do you want to talk to him? And they'll be like, oh no, I wasn't even calling to talk to him. I wanted to talk to you because I thought he was out. You That's know, right. I haven't, I haven't done that in like three, four, five years, but they, they understood that that was important. So I think that, yeah. you know, important too. whatever business you're in, have the stakeholders understand that, you know, you're going to need to have some free days where you're not going to be interrupted because you're going to have those family obligations going on. But it, yeah. it's definitely a challenge, especially my wife works in the practice. So even when we go home at night, you know, and, and I wake up early and I'm done earlier. She's more of a wake up later, work later. And there'll be times we'll sit on the couch at, at the house and she's working and I'm not. And she'll, she'll be asking me certain things. Can we do this, this, and this? And I'm like, listen, I'm done. Please send me an email. We'll talk about it tomorrow. That's uh, right. So, so you just have to kind of be able to build those, those lines and, and draw them and, you know, whatever works for you. But yeah. you can, my point is you can be obsessed with both be successful at both. And, right. uh, you know, it does take some work though. Yeah, no, you're hundred percent right. One thing that you said that was unique to your answer for sure was because you've gone through these different seasons of your kids being different ages, right? And so maybe something that you gave up, which really it was, it, it wasn't like that. It was just, you were being obsessed with your young children. And what that looked like for your business was that you took off Fridays for that period of time. But that now that they're older, you're obsessed with them in a different way. And so now you're back in the office on Fridays. And so I, I, that was just a very free flowing word picture, which hopefully gives the listener permission or freedom to be able to say, hey, look, like this season, it could be this month, it could be this quarter, could be this couple of years. You know, I, same thing with us. We've got four kids under the age of nine. It's like there are things that I'm doing in my life right now at a very, very intense clip mm -hmm. that you don't do right now. Right. Yeah, and that's OK. No. So I think that, like you said, it's, it's based up to the person, but you gave us just a really, really clear on-ramp there and off-ramp. And so I just really appreciate that perspective. I got one more question here for you, Larry. I got to know, if you could whisper in the younger Larry's ear, what would you say? Oh, that's a great, that's a great question. It'll all be okay. It'll <laughs> all work out. That, that's what I would whisper. Because I think, you know, we get obsessed we get hung up on a lot of times and sometimes we're our own worst enemy in That's that right. regard. And I think time and time again, it has proven to me that things end up working out, maybe not exactly the way you want them, 
but usually there's a reason why they worked out that way. And yeah. you may not know it in that moment. You may be disappointed in that moment. You may be upset with the way things are going down, but then you're going to have that moment later on, or even in that moment, you might see it, but a lot of times you won't. And then a week, a month, a year later, something will happen and you'll be like, wow, that was meant to be. So, yeah. and I, I think the point is that, you know, don't get hung up on those short-term decisions because there's usually a reason why you made that decision. There's a reason why that happened and it's, it's going to be okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. It's good freedom. Now, obviously it's hindsight, but the reality of it is, is that many of us are thinking of the future. And if we do that without maybe the right perspective, then, then we get a little anxious. And so I appreciate that. How can we find you? Number one, if, if the listeners have just connected with you and they're like, I need this guy's help building generational wealth and helping put financial resources together for my family, how can they find you there? But then also if they just want to connect with you as an entrepreneur, where can they find you? Yeah. So the easiest place is if you go to our website, Mitlin, M-I-T-L-I-N, financial.com, there's a contact us button. You can get in contact with us, schedule an is there a fit meeting. We'd be happy to have a conversation with you and see if we're a good fit for you and you're a good fit for us. You can also link out to our book there or its own URL, financialplanningmadepersonal.com is where you could grab the book. And then I'm on every social media platform there is. Most of them, you can find me under Lawrence Sprung. I made a marketing, going back to bad decisions. This was probably a bad decision, but I didn't even understand why or what I would need it for. Instagram, I'm Larry Sprung, but everywhere else I'm Lawrence Sprung. So you can find me or you just do old Google search and I'm, I'm everywhere. Go. So there you go. We can find you. Yeah. For a, for a man that has his own podcast and, and a book. And all these other places, I'm, I'm sure that you're easily found. You have authority in your space. You're a king in your, in your arena. And so just appreciate you being here, Larry. Nothing but blessings for your family and for your business and all your clients that you're touching every single day. Thank you for being here, sir. Thanks, Chaz. Appreciate it greatly. Thank you for listening to Gathering the Kings today. I hope that you were able to pull out a few nuggets to go apply into your business right away. More importantly, though, I hope that you're realizing that it takes more to be successful than just being by yourself, doing it all on your own, carrying the weight all by yourself. What I have realized, not only in my own journey from multiple businesses and multiple different industries, and now interviewing over two or 300 other very successful seven, eight and nine figure business owners is that it's tough to do it alone. And so Gathering the Kings exists to bring together successful entrepreneurs. In fact, we are putting together one thousand kings specifically who are grateful but not done we're intentionally assembling kings who fight tooth and nail for their business family and communities and here's what we believe that in the pursuit of excellence in those areas that it ignites within us the responsibility to govern power and forge a lasting legacy so if that relates and and resonates with you and you know that you need people around you sharp qualified other very successful business owners, I want you to go to gatheringthekings.com. I want you to take a look at what we're doing and see if it makes sense for you to be part of our pursuit to 1,000 Kings. Talk soon.